Welcome to another edition of Facebook Live, or Social Media Help Desk, I guess, on Facebook Live. I'm Jeff Soto, filling in for Katie, Alexander, Stephen, whomever, we're all here. <laughs> Along with me is Lila Meyer, Senior Content Editor, and Casey Martin, Junior Content Editor. Welcome, ladies. Um, we hope you guys are doing well. Uh, as you know, we're here every week on Tuesdays at 12.30 Pacific Time, 3.30 Eastern, to talk about all things social media. Um, really to help you, um, the business owner, the small business owner, the marketer, identify what you could be doing to elevate your marketing game. Um, and we just try to educate you. Uh, if you ever have any questions for us, please leave comments in the comment section below. Um, and if you have any deeper uh, requests about perhaps us managing any of your social media, feel free to reach out to us um, through our contact page on our website, uh, kwsmdigital.com. Um, we're going to start off today with something making the news, um, and this is something that's kind of dragged out. We've seen congressional hearings over this. It's the Facebook privacy, access, trolling, uh, election influencing, all that stuff. Um, so Facebook uh, has been putting out information that they've, they're handling trolls better, and they're ensuring that no one's going to be using their two platforms, Facebook and Instagram, and I assume WhatsApp in a certain degree, because Facebook owns that as well, um, to prevent any kind of election interference. And they've created something called Facebook Protect. And, and what do you guys think about them? And I'll explain what that is, but first, what do you guys think about having those measures in place as we head into the election season? I, don't know. I mean, I think they're doing their part, right? They were really scrutinized during the last election that they may not have done enough to um, report or at least alert their users of um, false information. And so it'll be interesting how they end up going about it just because it is a very touchy subject. And um, you know, we were, we were discussing it in the bullpen the other day is you can, you can spin every statistic. So it ends up becoming this question of um, what really is fake news. And so um, it will be interesting to see how they go about it. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. And I feel like it's always important, especially when you're you know, talking to other people that you have your facts right too, and I feel like that's really beneficial to really know and be 100% sure what you're saying and what you're hearing is correct, so. Yeah, we work with a lot of brands where they may put out scientific information or anything along those lines, a lot of statistics, and you have to be right, and especially when you work in a somewhat medical scientific field, I mean, that, that's straight on, but um, there is this thing about the fake news, if you don't want to believe you're gonna, we see it all the time, people call things fake news now all the time. It doesn't really matter which way you lean politically, it, it's just kind of, that's the term now to, you know, calling BS on somebody or saying, I don't believe you, or I don't wanna hear you. Certainly there are things out there that aren't real that are quote unquote fake news, real <laughs> fake news. Mm -hmm. It will be interesting, because this, this um, Facebook Protect, it's really geared towards anyone that's running for an election. Um, it's anyone that's tied, you may have campaigns toward an election, even if you're not a political figure. And so it's really giving you a safety net on how to protect yourself. Beware if anyone's, it's, it's extra measures in terms of accessing your accounts. It's extra measures in terms of some of the information that's passed through along your accounts on those channels. Um, so certainly everyone's got to elevate their guard if you're in a position where you're involved in an election. Um, and we always say, you know, even if you're not in political, uh, in the political realm, even as a business, you have to protect your reputation. And, and this is kind of a side conversation, but you know, there's this, people can come at you and make claims about your business that aren't true. We've seen that where people will come in and they'll have, uh, we just helped a client recently who had an employee who owed somebody money, a separate private issue unrelated to the workforce, the, the place of business. And yet this person went on every, this person who felt he was owed money by an employee, went on every business page of that business mm -hmm. and slandered the business and gave it a poor rating on Yelp, on Facebook, I think in Google as well, because they had a personal beef with somebody. So even businesses need to protect their brand, their branding a little, and need to make sure, like we said, if they use facts or whatever, they're on the straight and narrow because really, it is, it is a community and the dialogue, people will call you out if you're not right. Okay. Yeah, very true. And I think that, that this is gonna establish a new culture for business owners to always 
make sure that every post that they do put out, they have some sort of link or, or reference to where they got this information and no longer um, assuming that your information is correct and providing a level of, um, uh, I guess, proof that what you're saying is factual. No, definitely. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's just one of those things where we worry about and you know, especially we see that we run ads and we have we have products and services where you never know who you're hitting with those ads. Um, you're going after a, a target audience. You hope you're hitting the right people, but you will get people that will spam you. And it's it's important to even check those comments like yeah. hourly or every couple of hours to make sure that something isn't lingering on that page. That's really um, is someone spamming you, which we see a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, you want shoes? Well, look at these shoes. You know, and that's not really what you're trying to accomplish. So. Brands have to protect themselves as well, but this initiative is really for this election season, and I'm sure this will be something that we'll talk about as time goes on, and I think Facebook, I mean, they had to have learned their lesson. They got called into several hearings. They had to put information in place. Um, they made a point to put out in an email this week that they don't sell data, which was a huge um, issue um, in, in the last election as well with the data sharing. So. Um, that's kind of the topical news, not as fun, and it really probably doesn't apply as much to you on the business side. So let's dive into some things that do. Um, I think one of the things that we all rejoiced about was, and we use, are um, one of the big things we use, in case and I knew for one of your clients, we use Facebook events a lot, yeah. right? One of our clients has, what, eight to 10 Facebook events a month? Definitely. Month, and yes. so what do we see from that? Um, I mean, we definitely see a lot of people interacting, a lot of people getting excited about events coming up, and it's always nice to be able to see like what's going on in your areas, you know? And I feel like that's one of the biggest things, too. It, it is, and there's been a huge void in the event space up until now. <laughs> yeah. And that's what Lila's here to talk about. LinkedIn <laughs> has finally, you know, LinkedIn has been the slowest adapter to almost everything. Um, it was hashtags they finally incorporated. Now it's events, they're in, and so you're gonna, Lila's gonna walk us through Facebook events, and we find this really important because if you're, whether you're B2B or B2C, and I think most times people don't think that they're a, a viable option to do, they, they cost nothing to do, mm -hmm. and so like, this is a great step forward for LinkedIn, and so yeah. you're gonna explain more on this? Yeah, so for those people who are already familiar with Facebook events, this might be more of a recap, but LinkedIn events has made it possible now that you can set up an event and you can invite other LinkedIn users to be your co-organizers. And so that way you can lock in a time, you can have a, a destination, and you can get people to RSVP to your event through LinkedIn. And so Facebook has been doing this for years and it's been a really um, solid way to collect a community of people and also to be able to market to your attendees before, during, and after the event. And so um, putting that into the professional environment is really LinkedIn's way of um, following in suit of what Facebook is doing is creating more of a in-person environment and not making their tool about just digital connections but also taking those relationships offline. And so they've only, uh, they started out with testing it in India. Uh, so LinkedIn India was where the biggest need was and so um, the web, the, d the development team out there has been already using it for a few months. Um, LinkedIn took a shot at doing it in the U.S. market uh, last year, but it, or it just didn't, it didn't really catch on. I believe eight years ago, the last year they ran a beta test and that went really well. It was only in uh, San Francisco, I believe, um, and New York. Um, and so now that it's on your LinkedIn, um, you should be able to see it on your homepage. Um, it's all the hashtags you follow and then right below that it should say a little category of events. Um, it's pretty likely you don't have any events yet, but in the future those will all be listed there. Um, from a business standpoint, um, you can use LinkedIn right now to create your personal events. I have not seen the capabilities of creating it as a company page yet. Um, and you can only up until this point use it for um, organic uh, event sharing. So you can have all your employees put the event on their news feed, which is a really great way to spread the word. Um, but what you cannot do yet is put some ad budget behind it and boost it out to your target audience. So that's something that we'll all just be waiting, or I'll be waiting at the edge of my seat <laughs> until that day comes, and then I'll let you all know. <laughs> but yeah, um, have you guys tried the LinkedIn events yet? I have not. But I haven't. I started thinking about this. You know, we have a lot of B2B clients that do trade shows. Yeah. And, you know, typically, trade shows, we're not doing this to hurt you. 
Um, <laughs> typically, if you're going to, they, they trade shows will try to set up um, nightly hosts of cocktail parties or whatever, and that's a sponsored event where you, you're paying five to ten grand. You're you're renting out the bar and the convention center or an adjacent hotel where everyone's staying, and you're the host of the event. But really, if you're a savvy marketer and you wanted to have a coffee meetup at 8 a.m. or something like that, and you wanted to invite 10 to 12 of your targets to meet you at a Starbucks or at a you know a little boutique coffee shop, like what would stop you from doing that? As long as you know who's attending, you may have had dialogue or networking with people for the year leading up to this trade show. Now you can set things up for networking lunches or networking breakfasts, and, and it, it really doesn't even have to be limited to trade shows. It could just be your area, your area expertise. Um, you know, we're in Orange County, California. Um, you could reach out to Orange County, California partners and really use it almost as a meetup function, but where everyone has a common goal for business. And so I'm just thinking about the different ways to slice and dice and use this thing beyond hey, we're having social media boot camp on Fridays, would you like to attend? Here's the details, which we could do, and maybe we'll use this feature as we promote future boot camps. We have a boot camp coming up on Instagram in Atlanta. Uh, if it's not this Friday, I believe it may be next Friday. I'm not 100% sure. But, um, and my, my ear over there is not, not hearing me. What's our boot camp in Atlanta for Instagram? 25th. The 25th. So that's, that's, the, that's this that's week? That's this Friday. So that's this week. So anyway, if you're interested, if you're in Atlanta and you're watching, uh, we have our office there. Um, we're hosting an Instagram boot camp, so we welcome you guys to um, get some information on that. If you'd like, again, leave us a note in the comments. We can get back to you. We should create a LinkedIn event for it. We should create a LinkedIn <laughs> event for it. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So yeah, so I think um, exploring and playing with these things will be important. Mm -hmm. And you know, how do you see these things playing out like they play out on Facebook, Casey? You know, honestly, I just think they're completely different, you know, like Facebook, it's, you know, more, I feel like more fun events and, you know, social events and, I mean, you could do more professional events, but I feel like LinkedIn is just like, that's so important and I don't know why we haven't thought about that earlier, you know? I mean, just in general, like, for networking and just different things, like, that's amazing. You get to meet people, you know, in different industries and I feel like that's so crucial and, you know, it helps you kind of just network overall with bunch of people so yeah I mean LinkedIn really has turned into that networking tool and so um, you know I, I think there the savvy marketers will jump on that and use that somehow and I don't know Lila you can tell me if you can or can't can you use that even for a webinar yeah you can use it for anything um, as soon as you set up an event you're required to um, send them to a destination so this could be a link to your webinar sign up or an Eventbrite page. So really, yeah, the world is, you can do whatever you want with it. I mean, could you even, manipulate's a bad word, but could you even structure it so that if you had a landing page about a free consultation, you could create an event about a consultation? Does it have to have a specific date and time attached to it? Or can it be open-ended? I believe you have, do have to set a mm. specific date and time. So as you see, I mean, we're kind of bouncing things around and ideating. So I mean, it's one of those things. Get in there, look at it, play with it, um, figure out how you can maximize it um, for you. And um, good luck and leave us some feedback on what you find. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit. I'm going to go out of order because Lila just did that and give her a breather for a second. Um, she'll be talking about newsletters next. So if you've been hanging on for newsletters, we're going to make you wait another segment. Um, we're going to jump into hashtags. Um, I think... Uh, you know, there is still a lot of confusion. I know I just referenced a few minutes ago, LinkedIn has incorporated hashtags. They work a little differently than they do, say, on a Twitter or an Instagram. They're still, they're still effective. And Facebook's one of those places where people use them, but they really don't have much of an effect. There are a few times where you would use them. Anyway, um, Kaysen is here to talk a little bit about hashtags. What are they? How do they work? And we can kind of break down how we each see them on each channel and talk about that a little bit, and then we'll get into the newsletter conversation. Talk to us a little bit about hashtags. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so hashtags are just an amazing tool. I know it's something that we've been seeing a lot recently and just in general. Um, it's a great way for businesses and just for individual users uh, to find you know, different things going on in the area, find different people, you know, kind of build relationships, which is really great. And like Jeff was saying, um, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter, definitely the best places for them. Um, Facebook, maybe not so much. It's not as recognized there. Um, it's also, if you're looking to um, find some hashtags, 
Um, you know, just it's important to keep in mind um, maybe some SEO keywords, you know, because I feel like a lot of the time, you know, when you're looking, like just in general, when people are looking for things, there's certain words that are really popular, and so I feel like that would really be beneficial, um, you know, to find the maximum amount of people. So, um, so can we take a step back? Because for those people who don't know what a hashtag is, can you explain? Like, if I were to post something on Instagram and yeah. I had a hashtag, let's call it hashtag uh, Dogs of Orange County. <laughs> what what happens? Like, why why do I do this? How does it work? So basically, I mean, like you were saying, it's the hashtag is basically the pound sign that you see everywhere. Um, and what it does is it kind of puts that word or you know those words together into like a bucket to where anyone that is posting um, like about that using that hashtag, everyone can search and explore and find, you know, what it what does what are people doing right now? You know, like if you are at an Angels game and you hashtag, you know, hashtag angels or hashtag Dodgers, it's like anyone that's at that event can see what you're posting, see what's going on, keep up with the news, like what the score is, like, I mean, if anyone's posting about it, and it kind of keeps you connected with all of those people. Mm. So. Yeah, I think I think the word bucket, we use that a lot here, is, is there, you can get your content in front of a lot of people. I think a big mistake that people use uh, on Twitter or Instagram is they don't really use hashtags. And so, if you, if you just put out a message on Twitter, you're gonna hit your audience or someone who may luck into finding you. If you add a hashtag onto that, marketing, social media, if it were us and we were talking about something, we added those hashtags on, now anyone in the world who's looking for those terms may find our content. And that's, you know, I won't say that we've brought in new clients via hashtags, but people have certainly found us through these kinds of methods. And Instagram's the same way. And so. You use it as you're broadcasting your information. You want to get in front of all of these select eyeballs. So it might be for us, it's marketing, it's social media, it's you know SMM for social media marketing. It might be digital marketing, it might be agency life. You know, it might be hashtag Facebook, hashtag Instagram. It could be a wide variety of things. And so there are some techniques on how to use hashtags at best. LinkedIn, what do you say about five to seven hashtags there? Yeah, a little less. Yeah. Yeah. Really Fewer. just the, the most relevant four or five. And think of those as like categories where you would like to be found, especially on, yeah. on LinkedIn. Instagram, you're going to be 20 or so. And that you want to change those. You do not want to use the same hashtags all the time. You don't want to use the most basic hashtags all the time. Because the yeah. problem with us using marketing or social media is someone down the street is using that, someone in Cleveland is using that, someone in Russia is using that potentially. Mm -hmm. And so as people use those hashtags, the, the larger the volume, the harder it is to be found. But if you could use, um, if we used uh, social media Orange County or Orange County social media, now I don't know how many of those are out there, we would definitely put ourselves in a much more limited um, viewpoint. And so if I'm a business owner and I'm in Tustin or I'm in Newport Beach and I want to know, I might play around and go, oh, well, social media Orange County, boom, find KWS. And so there are ways to do that. And Twitter, same thing. Because of the characters, you only get 280. Your message is there. You don't want to load up a tweet with 15 hashtags. You put maybe two to four on there, if that. Yeah. And then Facebook, I think that's one where Facebook really doesn't have an infrastructure where it segments out hashtags. So if you're a fitness person and you already use the word fitness in, as a keyword in your copy, then using the hashtag fitness isn't going to help you. However, if you're attending, you know, Fitness Expo 2019, and that's a hashtag, and people are familiar with that event hashtag, mm -hmm. that is worth using because that is discoverable. And so there are limited times when you would use hashtags on Facebook, and so it really comes down to why do you use them? Well, you want to be found, and you want to get in front of new audiences. How do I use them? Well, you use them on these channels independently, and you know what benefit do I get is again, you can even reverse things and search for people that are looking for the, um, let's go back to Fitness Expo 2019. If I'm an attendee there and I wanna make connection, excuse me, if, I'm a, if I have a booth there, I'm a business and I have a booth, I wanna find every single person using that hashtag so I can interact with them. Mm -hmm. I may wanna find every brand using that hashtag to interact with them. I may wanna interact with the actual expo itself because they may share my content with their audience which is much larger. 
-hmm. And so there are ways to um, utilize hashtags in your favor that may not even be hashtags you create. And the last thing I'll add, and I'll let you guys take over on this, is branded hashtags. They work for some, they don't work for others. Um, you have to know if, um, I, the first thing that popped in my head was uh, those American Girl dolls, I don't know why. But like, I have no idea why that popped into my head. I was thinking something American and that came up. But the hashtag American Girl doll, if you go use American Girl doll, you will find all those dolls. That is a hashtag that if you take your daughter, my daughters had American Girl dolls when they were younger. If I take them to the store, the Grove or whatever, I get them a doll and I take a picture of their big smile and I will use that hashtag. Now every other parent in town can figure out, oh wow, what a feeling, I want that. And the brand benefits from it because they get user generated content out of it. So think about it that way. And I, I guess I've kind of spilled out and, and emoted too much about this, but you guys, what, share some of your guys' great techniques on, on for hashtags. So I like that you bring up the user generated content yeah. and maybe um, you can take on that one. I think one thought that just kept crossing my mind that I feel like we haven't touched on enough yet is deciding which hashtag to use. Mm -hmm. And so the strategy changes a little bit per channel. I think on Twitter, it's pretty easy to start searching the hashtag and finding if people are um, also using that in their content. I think there you wanna go more broad and just have a word that um, is frequently used that everyone who your target audience is would know that word. Mm -hmm. um, on Instagram, I've actually seen that it's, it's also a similar process of actually typing in the hashtag yourself. But what you can do as a business is let's say that you're following already hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people in your target market. Then when you are searching hashtags, it'll let you know that the people that you are following are already following that hashtag. So this is a great way to get in front of the audience that you wish would follow you because they don't necessarily have to be following your personal Instagram in order to see the post that you hashtagged. Um, and then with LinkedIn, which is a more new uh, concept of hashtagging, I think the best approach I've seen there is sticking with the um, hashtags that LinkedIn suggests to you. Yes. So as soon as you start typing, LinkedIn will start to guess what hashtag you are intending on using. Pick one of those. Because as soon as you go outside of their buckets, you'll find that no one is following that hashtag. And so the more followers for that hashtag, the more likely you're gonna sh be showing up in their newsfeed. So those are my three little tricks. <laughs> You want to share about user-generated content a little bit? Um, I mean, I feel like you guys covered it a lot. I mean, you guys like really went in depth, and I feel like <laughs> that's amazing. Um, I mean, just the biggest thing is just even where to put the hashtags. Like, I mean, I know you kind of touched on it too, but I mean, even though hashtags are um, super important, it's like you don't want to use too many of them either mm -hmm. because then it starts to look spammy, and you know, and there's certain ways to kind of hide them too, like when you go on Instagram, like a lot of people will put the hashtags in the comments, so that way it doesn't like, you know, kind of, I guess, make your posts look more spammy and everything too. So. Yeah, it can keep it, your posts clean when you put yeah. the hashtags in the comments, and that's actually a practice we use. We don't lie, you know, blow up our, our, our original posts with every fourth word as a hashtag, yeah. so if we say happy birthday and congratulations to so and so, whatever, we put all those hashtags down below and we leave the copy clean. I think the one point on, on user-generated user content we should uh, emphasize to people who are using hashtags, uh, you know, if you have a brand where you have invested and loyal followers, using your product or service is typically the case, um, they're creating content for you. And so um, you, know, you can post how great you are or you can use a hashtag that says, um, you know, KWSM, if, if someone came to our boot camp last Friday, uh, which we uh, talked about on LinkedIn and Lila presented it, and they, and they did, you know, KWSM boot camp and they used the hashtag, we might use that and say, hey, look at this post from Stephanie who attended our, uh, our LinkedIn boot camp. Here was her, her message. And so there are ways, especially if you have products or services where you have a big audience and a lot of users. Um, try to create some of those customized hashtags so that you can use some of their content. I mean, a lot of that is they want to build a relationship with you as the brand. And so if you share them 
on the brand's social channels, they'll feel a connection with you. And so that, that goes a long way. Yeah, um, definitely. Last thing here in our last five minutes, a lot of people ask us about newsletters, how to make them better, how to improve things like the open rate or the, the click rate. Um, so Lila has four quick tips on how to improve your email newsletters. And if you're not sending out an email newsletter, it's a huge mistake. You're, you, every day, you and your team are making, um, making other people's lives better. You're improving people's lives with your product or service, whether you're B2B or B2C. There's always a story to tell about what you're doing. People love seeing behind the scenes. There's absolutely no reason for you not to be doing email marketing. And sending one a month isn't spammy or obtrusive. It really is just keeping touch with people. So having said that, Lila, give us four great things that people should be doing if they're starting to roll out a newsletter program. Sure thing. So um, <laughs> newsletters are the ones that get delivered to your email inbox. And so um, we see the common trend now that most people are actually downloading um, email to their phones. And so if you're going to be building a newsletter, make sure that you keep mobile in mind. Um, a lot of people get really fancy with their, with their newsletter designs. They have multiple columns. They have a lot of information. They maybe even have a lot of photos. But all of that is not going to work on a mobile device sure. because you have to take into consideration that they have to scroll endlessly. They also um, have to have a really great Wi-Fi to be able to load all your super cool gifts. So just you know, really look at your newsletter and try to decide what is the most important piece of information and make sure that it's consumable on a mobile device. Um, the second thing, which goes kind of hand in hand with the mobile device, is keeping it clean. Because what people don't want to have is that it's really cluttered and that there's so many different images and different words and different sizings that it's very hard for them to even navigate through your, your newsletter. So just when you are creating your newsletter, um, make sure you keep the design clean. Um, at the same time, also make sure your subscriber list is clean because there is nothing more annoying than getting the same email twice. Yes. or getting this uh, from the same company an email on a daily basis when the majority of information is the same. So if you're gonna be sending out a subscriber list, um, just mass emailing everyone, just do one quick scrub and make sure that not uh, the same email is in there twice. Um, if people did unsubscribe from you, be respectful of that and um, make sure that you remove them from that list before you uh, send out your next blast. Because um, that is, at the end of the day, your customer. You want to have a good uh, relationship with your customers. Um, speaking of the customers, tip number three is to make sure that you add a level of personalization. If you know people's first name, because that's the way you've collected your uh, customer lists, then add high first name in the tags and give people that warm welcome. Um, if you don't know any information about them, you just have their email, consider thanking them for buying a specific product that you have tagged and associated to their email. You know, try to, try to really understand what they are looking for and build your email campaigns around that. And tip number four, um, with about one minute left to go, um, <laughs> is to make sure that you're A-B testing. Whether there's always going to be best practices on the on uh, the internet available to you, um, KWSM has a lot of resources on how to create newsletters. But the key thing to keep in mind is that you're never going to get it right the first time. And so, always allow yourself the opportunity to A B test your posts. Look for um, change, switching up your call to actions. Look for switching up your headlines, and just look at the data and see what your audience is drawn to and then do more of that next time and, and try something new. So with that said, those are my four tips. Um, we will be putting the actual blog in the description below. So if you want to read it um, and get a full uh, fledged recap of it, um, it's there for you. And again, if you have any questions about uh, any of the things we've talked about today, but specifically newsletters, um, we work with clients on all different platforms to build them. Um, numerous uh, platforms. Obviously there are a couple of more prominent ones that are out there and they're typically free up until a couple thousand subscribers or your audience grows to a certain size. And you may be working with a CRM that already is able to distribute uh, e-communications. It's just a great way to get in front of your audience. So we'd be glad to help you um, through any questions you have or if you need help running a monthly campaign or a more extensive email drip campaign where um, there's a lot of automations and sequences. Um, we can do that as well. So 
feel free to hit us up in comments or again reach out to us on the contact button. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, it's been another great week on Social Media Help Desk. If there's ever a topic that you'd like us to cover that we haven't covered, um, please leave us a note in the comments below and we'll, um, we'll try to talk about that. Uh, it's important that we deliver uh, information that's appealing to you and makes sense. So thank you very much and um, have a great uh, Tuesday afternoon.